We're entering chapter nine now, and chapter nine is all about identity. So let's start with a reminder. An identity is an equation That's always true. So outside of trigonometry, the statement that x plus y times x minus y equals x squared minus y squared that is an identity. It doesn't matter what X is. It doesn't matter what Y is. If you foil the left out, you get the right. And I mean, this is in contrast to something like X plus one equals two, which is only true for a specific value of X. and is therefore not an identity. So trigonometry has a lot of identities, of sort of varying levels of importance. We've already seen some of them. Let's remind ourselves. Probably the single most important identity in trigonometry we introduce early on before the chapter, before chapter nine, the Pythagorean identity, which says that the sine squared of X Thus, the cosine squared of x equals 1. That's an identity. It's always true. No exceptions. Doesn't matter what x is. And then there are sort of two other Pythagorean identities. Let's see. 1 plus the cotangent squared of x is the cosecant squared of x. And see, sine over cosine is the tangent squared of x plus one equals. The secant squared of x. So a Pythagorean identity is sometimes pluralized, and you sometimes think about there being three of them. Although if you just say the Pythagorean identity, everyone will assume you're talking about that first one. Then we have the co-function identities. The, the textbook, for some reason, doesn't, doesn't mention these in this chapter. It mentions them earlier, but cosine of pi over two minus x is the sine of x. And then you have six of these identities and they all look the same. A function of pi minus x equals the cofunction function 
of x. Uh, I don't know why I immediately went with a tangent there. And now that we've done the sine, cosine, tangent, and secant, I'm going to just say etc. This is true for the cosecant and the cotangent as well. And then we didn't use the, the word identity when we made these observations. But the cosine of negative x always equals the cosine of positive x. And the secant of negative x always equals was the secant of positive x. That, again, we didn't use the, the word identity. What we said was that the cosine and the secant are even. And then the other four trig functions, again, we didn't use the word identity, but we have these statements that are true for every x value. That if we plug negative x into these other four trig functions, we get negative the trig function and the way we expressed this fact at the time was that those other four trig functions are odd. And then we have these statements. The book calls them identities. I mean, they're sort of they're sort of fundamentally different from the identities, identities. Sort of fundamentally different from these, I'd say, but the secant of x is 1 over the cosine of x. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that as an identity. I just have said, well, that's the definition of the secant. But it's certainly an equation that's true for every value of x. So you can think of it that way. If you want, then it's like the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. The cosine is the reciprocal of the secant. The um, cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine. The sine is the reciprocal of the cosecant. The cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent. The tangent is the reciprocal of the cotangent. Then, 
not the sine. Again, sort of similar to these in the sense that I think of these more as a definition than an identity. But the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine and the cotangent is the cosine divided by the sine. And there are two pieces of material in section um, 9.1, sort of not, not super closely related to one another, but let's talk about algebraically rewriting and simplifying trig expressions. So this is something that we especially do with the identities on this frame. And it's the observation that because of because of these definitions, because of these identities, some fractions or products involving trig functions might be rewritable in a simpler way. I mean, the sort of very or kind of trivial example of that Suppose you see the cosine times the secant. Well, the cosine times the secant can be simplified significantly. Because the secant is one divided by the cosine and those cancel out. So the cosine times the secant is something much simpler than, than what it looks like. The cosine times the secant is one. I mean, similarly, but a little less, uh, a little less trivial, let's say. Say that you have the tangent of x divided by the sine of x. Now let's see what we can make of this because the tangent is itself a fraction of the sine and the cosine. So maybe the sine and the cosine can be combined or rewritten or cancel each other out. And, you know, in this particular case, they can. When we have a fraction that looks like this, a fraction of fractions, where the numerators are the same, we can simplify that. We, the specific, I mean, the formal way of doing it is that we can multiply top and bottom by one over the sine. 
in the top, we get one over the cosine, those signs cancel. In the bottom, we get one. The signs cancel and all that's left is one. So that's one over the cosine. which is the secant. So the tangent divided by the sine equals the secant. Um, sometimes you can't really do this, or if you do do it, you're, you don't really get anything nicer than what you started with. Um, I mean, if we had... the tangent of x divided by, instead of the sine, the cosine of x. Now you could certainly rewrite this. The sine of x over the cosine all divided by the cosine over one, but stuff doesn't cancel in this case, the way it did in the last frame. What you could do, you could divide top and bottom, by the cosine, and then you'd get the sine of x over the cosine squared of x, but whether the sine of x over the cosine squared is nicer or less nice than the tangent of x over the cosine is probably not so evident. So this kind of algebraic messing around can be very productive. Other times, less so. Notice what we're getting here are identities. Um, there are, because these trig functions are so interrelated, there are basically an unlimited number of identities that you could write down if you wanted to. I mean, the fact that the cosine of x times the secant of x equals 1 is, for intents and purposes, an identity. I mean, you can quibble and you can say, oh, but the secant isn't always defined, whereas 1 is. But for intents and purposes, this is an identity. And it's not an identity you'll find in, you know, if you if your textbook has a list, it's not going to show up there, but it is a statement that's always true. You know, similarly, that the tangent of x over the cosine of x is the sine over the cosine squared. That's an identity. It's not an identity that has a name, but it's an identity nevertheless. So there are identities other than sort of the standard ones, the ones that get names and get put in the boxes by textbooks. 
And something that textbooks, I shouldn't say just textbooks, but something that textbooks sometimes are interested in is what they call verifying identity is. And I don't want to obsess over this material. It can be the, the ratio of trickiness to usefulness seems all wrong to me, but when you're asked to verify an identity, you're given a statement that is true. Like, <laughs> the tangent of x over the cosine of x, let's, uh, let's take what we have on that last frame and let's uh, complicate it slightly, is the sine of x divided by one minus the sine squared of x. Or at least I believe that should be true. Let me go real quick to desmos.com. And let's, uh, let's check this out graphically. Here's the tangent of x over, wait, it wasn't over the sine of x. Here's the tangent of x over the cosine of x. So we get this unfamiliar graph. If I'm doing everything right in my head, Let's see the sine of x divided by one minus the sine of x squared. And yes, these graphs are indeed identical. As I turn them on and off, we see the exact same graph. So when you talk about verifying identities, you're really talking about mathematical proof. And mathematical proof is something we don't really do on this level. I mean, you might in high school, if you take, I don't know actually what the curriculum in Nebraska is, in Pennsylvania, you have to take high school geometry, and there's some like, here's a figure, proof that this angle equals this angle. But trigonometry is kind of an anomaly in asking students to do this. And the way that we verify an identity, it's an art rather than a science, but we start with one side of this fraction and we mess around with it and we try to make it look like the other side of the fraction. And in general, you want to start with the side of the fraction that looks more complicated. I'm not sure how well that's actually going to work out in this example. 
but we need to start with one side of the fraction and we need to just start messing with it. And because of the kind, I mean, the reason we normally don't ask um, sort of people to do proofs in lower division math classes is that it is a kind of very fuzzy, very experimental. There are no rules, just to mess around and hope things work out kind of process. But what can we do here? I mean, the sine of x is basically the sine of x. I don't see much that we can do with the sine of x. We could, I guess, in theory, we could rewrite the sine of x as 1 over the cosine. Or we could say that the sine of x is the cosine of pi over 2 minus x. But it's not clear why we'd want to introduce the cosecant. And we certainly don't want any pi minus 2 is or whatever that was. Let's leave the sign of x alone. What about 1 minus the sine squared, though? Does the sine squared seem familiar to you? No. I'm getting a head shake. That's fine. But we do have an identity where the sine squared shows up. And that's the Pythagorean identity, which, if we rewrite this a little, says that the cosine squared of x is 1 minus the sine squared of x. So we have 1 minus the sine squared. We could replace that with the cosine squared. And this seems a little more hopeful than what we were doing earlier. Or this seems a little more hopeful than any of the things I commented on when I was talking about the sign, where, you know, you could replace the sign with the cosecant, or you could replace the sign with this pi minus two thing, because this gives us a cosine, and we do want to have a cosine. We want to have that cosine there. So this is the sine of x over the cosine of x times the cosine of x. And now a thing about fractions and a thing about multiplication. Multiplication is actually really nice in fractions. We can just break this into two. We can say, well, we've got that sine over that cosine. And then we've got one over the cosine. Why did that occur to me? Well, again, this is sort of an art more than a science 
but I see that we do want a tangent, and I know that a tangent is a sine over a cosine. So that seemed like a good thing to try. That then becomes the tangent times one over the cosine, and then the way fraction multiplication works, that's equal to the tangent of x over the cosine of x. And that is what we want, this thing in the front equals this thing here. And that's the identity that we said we wanted to, to verify. Let's just do one more of these. Let me see if I can the cotangent of x plus the tangent of x. Equals, I lost my, about three minutes before class, I realized I didn't have my class notes. So sorry that I'm trying to reproduce these in my head. Um, I think that this is true. Again, because I'm trying to reproduce it in my head. Let's make sure we don't spend a bunch of time trying to verify a false identity. Here's the tangent plus the cotangent. Here's the secant times the cosecant. And my my mental uh, math has not forsaken me. As we turn these graphs on and off, we see that they are the same graph. So this equality seems to be true, but can we verify it? And again, it can be hard to know, I mean, even before you do anything else, you have to make a decision. And that decision is, which side are you going to start with? Are you going to first write down this? And then try to mess around until you turn it into this, or are you going to try starting with this and mess around until it turns into this? And I mean, the sort of the thing we get pulled is well, you should start with the more complicated side because then there will be more things you can try to do. It's not always a super clear what that means in practice though, which of these sides is more complicated than the other. But, Lacking a very clear idea, 
Here we went from the right to the left. So just for variety, let's try to go from the left to the right. Okay, so the thing is about these cotangent and these tangents and these secants and cosecants, they're all defined in terms of the sine and the cosine. So, I mean, what we're trying to show here, written another way, is that the cosine over the sine plus the sine over the cosine equals one divided by the cosine times one divided by the sine. And the reason I make this observation is that it suggests that probably working with these sines and cosines is the easiest way to go about this. I mean, when you look at the cotangent and the secant, you might think, well, these have nothing in common. But when you write them in terms of the sine and the cosine, you say, well, they're both fractions. They both have the cosine in them that there is some relationship between these things. So let's do this. Let's rewrite everything in terms of cosines and sines. And sometimes you do something and it, it suggests a next step. And again, I've, I'm obviously sort of experienced with this. I mean, I'm not pretending this should jump out to you, but when I see addition like that, my first thought is, okay, well, we should probably do the addition. And to do the addition, we're going to need common denominators. And the common denominator here is the sine times the cosine. And I actually really like that. When I see that that's the common denominator, I, it makes me think we're heading in the right direction because we want to have the sine times the cosine in the denominator of a fraction. So here on this, on the left, we multiply top and bottom by the cosine. Here, we multiply top and bottom by the sine. And we get the sine squared of x plus the cosine squared of x all divided by the sine of x times the cosine of x. What should we do now? Okay. If, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just saying, go through your notes if you have to but there is something that's hopefully going to jump out to us when we see sine squared plus the cosine squared. Okay. 
N equals one. N equals one. Is exactly correct. And again, people, I think people tend to think multiplication is harder than addition, but when you have fractions, multiplication is super nice. If we had addition down here, that would be a mess. With multiplication, we can break this one fraction, into a product, then one over the sine is the cosecant, one over the cosine is the secant. And we've, you know, we, if we wanted to be truly persnickety about this, we could then say, well, multiplication is commutative, so we can reorder those as the secant times the cosecant. And this is the identity we were asked to verify. And we started with this, and we got a bunch of equalities, and we ended up exactly where we wanted to end up. And that's section 9.1. So I need to think, think what I want to do. We're moving a little ahead of the online students. Um, but I'll figure that out and I'll see you in class on Friday.